Well, Mary and I are discussing the Paget messages again, but this time I've chosen the Paget message rather than Mary. The Paget messages that we wanted to discuss today are from Joseph Salyutz, and they're talking about the laws of the spirit world. And uh, there's two messages. One, the message was broken into two. One was given on the 13th of April, 1915, and the other on the 3rd of May, 1915. And we just wanted to discuss the, these two messages because they, they have a lot of very meaty information about them, about what a person, um, how a person passes over into the spirit world and what they first encounter in terms of the things they need to learn in the spirit world. And I feel there's still many people on earth, even after reading the pageant messages, they don't really understand these two messages. So um, what we would like to do is discuss them together. Yeah. So welcome to Mary to discuss this, these two messages together. They're quite long messages, so we may not get to discuss both of them today. Um, we're hoping we'll f get the first one done at least, yeah. and we'll see how we go. Okay, well, what I thought we'd do is just um, read the messages and then stop at each main point that we'd like to make about what the messages are saying. So I'll, I'll start reading the first section. And I am here, Professor Salyutz. Well, I am here as agreed and will endeavour to write you my thoughts on the subject. What may spirits know about the laws of the spirit world after they've been in that world for a short time? As you know, I have been here for a comparatively short time. And while my studies have been to a considerable extent in the study of these laws, yet I find that I have limited knowledge of the same. And much of my information has been gathered from spirits who have lived here a great many years and who have devoted their study and investigation to these laws. Well, I was just thinking there how he's, he's showing that most of the time you're still receiving information from other people who have investigated something. Mm. And his own studies, he, he, he realised that while he's been there and studying as much as he could study, and, and Joseph was a very good studier in the sense that he, he used to studying while he was on earth, obviously yeah. being a judge in the legal profession. And, uh, and so he was always studying also once he entered the spirit world. And he thought it was imperative to give to Paget as much of the information as he possibly can after he passed. But, but even with all of that, he had to go to people who were much more learned than him about the laws. And in fact, uh, many spirits are involved in studying the laws of the universe, some on the natural love path and some, uh, and many on the divine love path. Mm. Yeah, and I like how as, as the message progresses, we start to learn a lot more about this issue of learning from others and, mm. and understanding what it means to grow in the spirit world. So, yeah. yeah. So this is the first thing he says. Well, I, first, I want to first say that no spirit, by the mere fact of having shortly before made his advent to this world, has received any much greater knowledge than when he had on earth. <laughs> and I feel that's the, that is a very key point that most people do not realise, that there is this strong conception on the planet still that once you die, you automatically become the knower of all things somehow. There's this, uh, and, and a lot of this kind of concept comes from the teachings of reincarnation in the sense they're saying that we've had many times when we're sped in the spirit world and so therefore when we go back there we remember everything that we knew and then we come back to earth and then we're clueless while we're on earth and then we go back to the spirit world and then we remember. And these kind of teachings cause people to believe that they must know everything in a different state. And as he points out here, this is completely false teaching. This whole concept that you would know more than what you currently do is ludicrous to the extreme when you think about it, in the sense that we only know by learning. And, and if we're unprepared to learn, then of course we won't know very much. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose a lot of people feel, I suppose it's not also not based in the reincarnation teachings, but in Christian teachings that you either go to heaven or hell. Mm. And the, the um, implication is if you're in heaven, then you must you must know what God knows. Know what God knows, mm. and it's such an important truth, like misconception on the planet, isn't it? That if everyone could understand that one truth, that when you die, you don't really know much more than except that you've you, died. You, you keep <laughs> living after you they die. Sometimes they don't even know that. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Many of them that we've spoken to don't even exactly. know that they have passed. So, yeah. 
Um, and or they, are confused and about what passing, what state they're in and what's going to happen next. Yeah, yeah. And, and as we'll point out from different messages that are in the Paget messages, there's actually accounts that Paget had where the person didn't really know that they had passed over, but they assumed they must have passed or <laughs> something must have changed because everyone who were their friends didn't talk to them anymore <laughs> when yeah. they appeared before them. So. Yeah, so I feel that's a very important principle to mm. understand. Mm. And it's very important for people to understand too that I feel it's one thing to think about that, but quite another thing to think about, well, if that's the case, then it would make sense for me to try to understand as much as possible, not only about the universe, but also the universe in which we live physically while we're on Earth, but also while we're on Earth, to know as much as possible about things that ha would happen after we passed. It's, it's obviously the rest of our existence. Mm. So it would make sense to study information about what's going to happen after you die. And, and I find most people ignore the state because, of course, they don't want to feel that they'll die. Most people, are, you know, it's the one thing that happens to everyone. And yet it's the one thing most people are still quite afraid of. And, and their fear is the direct result of not knowing the truth about what happens after you die. So it would make sense, given that one statement, that you learn a lot more on earth about what's going to happen after you pass than what most people are prepared to do. Hmm. Yeah. Well, most people don't really even want to investigate it, do they? No. Because they're afraid it'll mean separation. Yep. from their family or their loved ones, that it'll mean judgment in some way, yep. uh, that they'll be called to some judgment day where they have to answer for what they've done, and that's very scary for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of fears around death that or that it'll just be black and nothing and there'll be no more pleasure, there'll be no more uh, adventure, there'll be no more learning. Yep. And so all of those things... People are so terrified to discover those things that they don't even investigate what else might be going to happen. Yeah. yeah. And I feel that that's, uh, a, you know, these are big issues that people face on Earth. Most people also want to remain blind to the fact that they're going to die. Mm. And, and I feel there's a lot of fear involved in that as well. And in fact, when you talk to people about death, they then say to you generally, oh, you're being morbid now or you're being, <laughs> you know, they look at it as a negative discussion when... The reality is that we've spent a very short period of our eternal life, life on earth yeah. and then we spend a very, very long period in the spirit world so it would make sense that we find out about what we're going to pass into and find out with an open mind uh, without having preconceived notions or ideas, which mm. is something that comes up in these messages. And Joseph... Salyards has done us a great service because he's about to tell us a lot of things that happen. <laughs> that happens. And the away. laws that govern it, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So would you like to read the sure. next uh, pa pa paragraph? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My knowledge of spiritual laws when on earth was not very extensive. And I found when I came into the spirit world that I did not know much more than I did before I came. And such is the experience of every spirit. But... As I continued to investigate these matters, I discovered that my capacity for learning was greatly increased and that my mind was more plastic and received this knowledge more easily than when I was a mortal. This is largely due to the fact that the brain, I mean the mortal brain, is, when compared to what you might call the spirit brain, a thing of much inferior quality and not so capable of learning the cause and effect of phenomena. Yeah, so here I thought this was another primary truth that once you pass and you've stripped off the physical body, the physical body is no longer impeding your progress. Mm -hmm. and, and although you still have the same emotional conditions and belief systems, the mind of the spirit body, um, before having to use the brain of the physical body in order to think and process information, now is not restricted by the brain of the physical body. Now, the reason why that happens is not as he's sort of really stating. The reason it happens is because most people do not understand that when you ha have a huge amount of different emotions in your soul, that it affects the development of the physical body's brain. Mm. And as a result of that, the physical body's brain has a difficulty assimilating information. And this is a, a, a difficulty that most people on earth have. And particularly a difficulty with logical reasoning. There is a, yeah. there is a deep restriction based upon, by the emotions, placed upon the mind 
of the ability to have any logical thought or logical reasoning. And, and logical reasoning is a necessary part of understanding cause and effect. Yeah. And this is one way that spirits measure or, or work out how, what the truth is by me- seeing the cause and e- examining the effect. And because they have a much greater scope of seeing causes and effect, they have the ability then to assimilate this intellectually and use their mind in a different, in a different way to understand the truth. Mm. So really, and as he points out, <coughs> he hasn't been in the spirit world very long. No. So he's just observing, wow, when you come here, you can understand things pretty, like suddenly there's this quicker way to understand. As long as you are emotionally open to the particular thoughts that you might have. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that is really a truth, whether we're in our mortal body or our spirit body. That's correct. Yeah. So if I'm completely blocked uh, emotionally to understanding that the Bible is not God's word, when I pass over into the spirit world, for example, I will still be completely blocked emotionally to looking at the Bible as not God's word. Mm. So I will still believe it to be God's word. And so I will then carefully nitpick the Bible, looking at all of the things that justify to myself my emotion, which is that the Bible is God's word. And I'll come up with all these logical arguments and reasoning that were, were expanded viewpoints of what I had on earth. But in the end, because my emotion is blocked towards even considering that it's not God's word at all, I will still be blocked to that consideration. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's just another example, isn't it, of how humility unlocks truth for the yeah. soul. Yeah, yeah. Um, and even in my personal experience, I freak out about maths because I have all these emotions about not wanting to be stupid or, or, or even my logic is marred by this sense of inadequacy or n- a fear of appearing stupid. Mm. And and so I, I lose track or I lose trains of thought or mm. I... When I'm when I'm really resisting those emotions, and mm. it's just it's just a microcosm of a, a larger process, isn't mm. it? Mm. And even you mentioned that it even affects the development of the human brain. Now there mm. is so much mm. in that in that is not well understood on the earth at the at the moment. Yeah. You know, there's many children who have so-called learning disorders and learning difficulties, and they're diagnosed with certain conditions. Mm. And if we were to understand on the earth that this is because of emotional damage that mm. has happened to mm. a child in their formative years. And there is a huge correlation, uh, having worked in those fields, between children who do have um, very difficult socioeconomic or broken families and things like that in their early childhood to ones that have difficulties learning in school. Mm. And so people can see this correlation, but that this strict scientific mind doesn't really want to make, marry the two up. Mm. And um, as a former therapist who worked in paediatrics, uh, um, I, had a, I had a colleague who used to say, sometimes, Mary, I think the most important thing I do for these kids is give them self-esteem mm. and they seem to improve. Mm. And really that's we're doing physical things to help their neuromotor integration, <laughs> but really are we just helping them to to grow, to receive love mm. and to, to grow. And mm. yeah, a lot of implications really, isn't there? Yeah, the development of the mind. I, I feel a lot of people who don't understand too that the spirit body's mind is less encumbered by these things because it also has a much faster way of operating. So, so the physical body takes time to respond to stimuli changes. Mm-hmm. And um, some of the instant stimuli changes, like pain, for example, cause usually an instant response. But, but other stimuli changes, which are emotional, mean that the human body has to take time to heal. The genetic process and the replication process of the cells determine how rapidly the body heals from the emotional impact of the different emotions that have been imposed upon the body and the mind's development. But in the spirit form, if you, if you heal in a certain condition of love, there's an instant re- reflection or very close to instant reflection in your spirit body. Sure. Your body heals up very, very rapidly as a result. And because of this, there is also this healing of the mind. Mm-hmm. Once people in the spirit world discover that they can use their mind, then their mind and their brain starts to heal. If they don't discover it, though, like Joseph Salyers has, then their mind and brain does not heal for yeah. many, many years. And often they retain their lack of intellectual development for many years until somebody demonstrates to them that they can have the confidence that it can heal through a process. 
So uh, the, although Saliards is saying these things, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that as soon as you pass over, you'll instantly be able to work out certain things that you couldn't before. It just depends on whether you have an emotional openness to the areas of investigation. Now, in his case, he had a fairly diverse education when he was on the planet. Yeah. And so he had quite a large emotional openness to learning different things. And so he could fairly rapidly assimilate things into his spirit body's mind. But, but other people have a very, very closed life on Earth, a very strong resistance to knowing new things. And as a result, their, their mind, their spirit body's mind, is not as plastic as he calls it <laughs> yeah, when they arrive in the spirit yeah. world. Yeah. And also, he, he admits that his knowledge of spiritual laws when on Earth wasn't large. So mm. in a way, he didn't have any preconceptions that would limit his understanding of these things. Yeah, but uh, aside from that, he, he had discussed with some people about the concept of that spirit world so he was also open to the concept of continuous learning. Yeah. So, so he, yeah, had, sure. he had, did not have the emotional restrictions that many people have about continuous learning once they pass. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. And this next comment actually demonstrates that. He says, I am now undergoing a course of study that will, I have no doubt, give me wonderful information of these laws so that ultimately I become, may become what you mortals might call a learned man. <laughs> The first and to me the most important law that I have learned is that a man continues to live in the spirit world without his earthly body. This great law, while to you and many others is well known and is an established fact, yet to me it was not known, as I had never had any experience in spiritualism and had never given any study to the subject. When I arrived in the spirit world, I learned that this law was one of God's truths, and that it is fixed and will never change, for all will survive the change of so-called death. So this particular principle, which I feel is a primary, people, yes. people on earth, they say that, that they have a belief that there is an afterlife, but their level of fear about death is so big that you have to question whether people really do have a strong faith or belief mm -hmm. that there is an afterlife. Yeah. And, and he, as he admitted, did not have a strong faith that there was an afterlife. And, and in fact, when you look at the different holy books, they very much contradict uh, themselves on the matter of an afterlife. And so some people believe that when you're dead, you're dead. And some people believe that when you're dead, there is some kind of heaven that you can go to. And some people believe there's a heaven and a hell. And, yeah. and a lot of people have no fixed belief whatsoever. And and yet this is a, this is a one primary belief that if, if everyone on earth understood that death was just a very small change in mm -hmm. their future life, they would be less focused on what's happening at their death and far more focused on learning about what might happen afterwards and, and changing their life while they're alive on earth to suit what, what, what is going to happen afterwards in terms of their development. And I feel like if, if we really received that truth in our soul, this emphasis that is really prolific on the earth that that material things are so important to mm, us. Mm. Uh, what we achieve in terms of wealth, in terms of possessions, in terms of even study and career, a lot of that is based on, you know, it's really based in this earth plane. Whereas if we knew that um, actually this is, a, this is a step along the way of something much bigger and I'm not going to be able to take those things with me, what is it I will take with me? We would change our, I believe, change our entire focus. And onto, our entire education system. Perhaps, <laughs> yeah, well. perhaps. A lot of things would change, wouldn't they, if yeah. we really knew that one truth. Yes. Just that one truth, yeah. Yeah. So okay. do you want to read from there that we're uh, on the next great yes. law? Yeah. yeah. The next great law that I learned is that no man can of his own power make his condition or position in the spirit world just what and where he would have it to be, mm. have it be. This is another fixed truth and one which many spirits even do not fully comprehend. For they think or so express themselves that all they have to do is exercise a little willpower and they can move from certain conditions. But this is not true. For the law controlling this matter never has any exceptions in its operation. Mm. Which is another huge truth, isn't it? Yes, I, I believe that there are so many people on earth who, who sort of feel like, oh, 
I don't need to worry about the future life, right? There's this constant thought that they don't really need to worry about it for two reasons. One is that they have an indetermined viewpoint of whether there is a future life or not. And then the second one is that if they do believe there is a future life, they'll, be, they'll somehow feel that they'll be able to change wherever they arrive quite easily just by exercising their willpower, just like they can on Earth change from you know, living in Brisbane to living in Kingaroy, in our case here in, in Queensland, um, just by exercising their will. Yep. And, uh, and their location of residence, they believe, is as ch- it can be changed as easily uh, as, as it is on Earth. And that is not the case mm. at all. And in fact, most spirits are totally confused about why they cannot exercise their willpower to change, that something else has to change, which of course is the condition of love in the soul of the individual. But they often don't realise that. And they, they, they're trying to change, trying to obtain a new location of residence because many of them arrive in places that are not very pleasant and much worse than any condition they lived on Earth. And as a result of that, they... Uh, are trying to change and use their willpower to change and they find it very, very difficult and, in fact, impossible because yeah. it's not possible to use your will to change your location without there being a change in condition of some kind. Yeah. Mm. And this belief is pretty prolific on the earth as well, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I'll just use some positive affirmations. <laughs> I'll, uh, yep. you know, I'll... think good thoughts. I'll use my willpower. I'll imagine what I want. And while some of those things might help to open us to desire, they certainly don't equate to a change in our true sp- condition, tr- spiritual condition, really, yeah. unless something else is triggered through that process. Yeah. Yes, and this whole concept that you can change your position without changing your condition is a very damaging concept, I feel, on earth, because people believe that they can just exercise their willpower once they pass and get to a new place, and that's not going to be the case. They, no. they, they cannot do that. And uh, it will be dependent upon the, how their soul works in harmony with God's laws that have been previously established and all of those laws are surrounding the, the principles of love. So it will depend on how much love is in their soul as to whether they can use their will to go to a different location yeah. or not. And, and their will will be constrained by the lack of love in their soul. Yeah. And this is where I feel there's a big problem also on the earth, not understanding that true spiritual development comes from love, not from any other quality. Yeah. Yeah. And that we can't emulate love. We can't will ourselves. You can't fake it. You can't fake it until you you make it. You can't have an intellectual viewpoint of love. No, no. no. And it's exhausting to live like that, to be constantly trying to live in positivity because you're actually working against what your soul is trying to tell you. Yes, because quite often in the soul there's all these emotions that want you to go and do negative things and you're wanting to do, you know, with your yeah. will, wanting to do something positive, not understanding that while these emotions are driving your actions, then you'll probably still finish up doing the negative things at some point, particularly if you take away punishment. Yeah. Like, so most people only do the positive things because there is a fear that God will punish them mm. or a fear that the law will punish them. Mm. If you took away the law completely and you took away any fear of God's punishment, many people would, have, would feel very unrestricted to do many evil things, yeah. uh, even though they think they have a desire to do something positive. Yeah. Mm. And th- this really relates to issues of um, self-love as well, doesn't it? Where mm. if I just take the example of healthy eating, a lot of people um, use their willpower to try to stay healthy. Mm-hmm. And yet, if they are, when they were younger or maybe other people can eat whatever they want and remain on the outside apparently healthy. healthy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so when that, the fear of becoming fat or something isn't there, that they don't care to eat well. Yeah. It's only when they feel like, oh, you know, I should look after how I appear to other people or yeah. something like that. That then the willpower gets enforced, but it is such a force of will. Mm. Whereas if we healed the things inside... Which is why, why most people yo-yo diet, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Because <laughs> they diet for a while and then, of course, when yeah. they stop dieting, they go back to their old habits. Yeah, mm. yeah. Or they create elaborate regimes and mm. all kinds of things to try and, and then they run 10 kilometres yeah. as well to try and keep this this balance thing yeah. whereas I feel if we heal ourselves emotionally it doesn't matter how we look on the outside we want to love what's on the inside yeah and and again it's the same kind of principle isn't it that if you force yourself you you, you, you th- people on earth believe they can force themselves into a condition and physically that may be possible and certainly most people on earth try to attempt or attempt it 
But, but what we're talking about here is spiritually, it's definitely not possible. No. You can't force yourself into a new yeah. condition without the actual condition changing. Yeah. And, uh, and this is, I feel, one of the basic principles that most people on earth, because they think they can force their physical form into a condition that's changed, they then believe that they can also do the same spiritually. Yeah. And it's not the case. It's not the case. And I suppose what I was alluding to is even the physical result requires such an effort, effort yeah. to combat the spiritual condition yeah. that it's very hard to Because the spiritual condition is driving, or the emotional condition of the individual is driving their desire to eat certain things. Exactly. Yeah, and if you yeah. get rid of those desires, then obviously, obviously everything changes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Anyway, that's yeah. a digression probably. So uh, the next paragraph says, man or spirit can, in a way, determine what his destiny may be, but when once fixed by this great power of will which God has conferred on man, he cannot, by the exercise of that will, change that fixed condition until the laws of compensation have been satisfied. And even then the change is not brought about by the exercise of his will, but by the operation of the laws releasing him from memories and recollections which hold him to the conditions that his life has placed him in. So when men think that they, by the exercise of their own will, can release themselves from a condition which they have made for themselves, they are mistaken. So what, what he's alluding to here is that, that they exercise their will on earth thinking they can do anything. They pass over to the spirit world. They realise now their condition is locked into a location and only the law of compensation or another law, which he mentions later, can, can actually release the person from that particular place. Mm -hmm. And that it requires changes in the heart. That requires changes in the emotional makeup of the individual, their belief systems and other things. So... They can, as he says, in a way he can determine his destiny, but only by changing the underlying things that cause the change in the condition. Yeah. So, so he can't physically will himself to go to a different place without the actual changes taking place. And, and this is what he's really saying in this section. And something that I noted when I was reading this before was that just he's really pointing out that we are governed by God's laws. Mm. We, you know, it doesn't change these laws. The truth that we that we survive death <laughs> doesn't change, yeah. and this this idea that we can't move unless we fulfil the law of yeah. compensation. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I'll just continue reading sure. as it's the same thing. Many spirits here have this idea and believe that if they only chose to exercise their vaunted willpower. <laughs> they would relieve themselves of their darkened condition and get into happier conditions. But strange, they never try this, and the reason, therefore, is apparent. They could not if they tried, and will not try because they cannot. And yet they think that when they get ready, they will only have to exercise this will and the change will follow. No, this law is as fixed as any law of this great universe of God. So, so I feel like, Many of the people who are trans, uh, transmitting messages from the spirit world at the moment believe this willpower thing um, very, very strongly. And, and the reason why is because many of the spirits are still very convinced, even though they've not put it personally into action, yeah. they're very convinced that they will be able to change their location or, uh, or position in the spirit world just by exercising their will and no other change. Yeah. And, uh, and as a result of that, these spirits then come and talk to mediums uh, and tell the mediums the same thing. So the people who listen to the mediums pass over in a spirit world thinking they'd be able to do the same. And it just perpetrates this idea mm -hmm. that is very, very false and also then causes these spirits to go into this sort of like self-justified, arrogant sort of, I am here because I choose to be here. Not, and, and if I only exercise my will, I'll be able to get to a different condition, but I don't feel I need to exercise <laughs> yes. my will. Thank you very much which is all just a lie because at the end of the day, if they did exercise their will, they'd be disappointed yeah. by the result and therefore prove, it'll prove to them that their, their thought is incorrect. And it's, it's a, it, I feel it's sort of, it's the same on earth with a lot of people. We convince ourselves of an outcome that we've never tried mm -hmm. because of all sorts of emotions that we don't want to uh, deal with. Yeah. And as a result of that, we, we convince ourselves to not even try the particular yes. thing that, that might demonstrate the truth to us. 
And I feel that this is what's happening. Uh, most of the time, this is what's happening in the spirit world with yeah. these spirits. And that's, that was what I noted, was just the danger of having untested beliefs mm. and, and how damaging it is when spirits come and share these untested beliefs with people on earth. So mm. if I was talking to a spirit who was telling me a great deal of truth, I'd be asking them, well, have you tested this? Because otherwise you're telling me a theory. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And a lot of spirits channel to people on earth theories. Yeah. And that, that aren't proven as fact. Yeah. Okay, you wouldn't okay, uh, yeah. need the next two paragraphs. Probably. Mm. Of course. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course. <laughs> of course, while man or spirit cannot by the exercise of his will change his condition, yet in order to secure that change, the will has to be exercised. Because the help which comes from without and which is absolutely necessary to man and which causes the change and will not come unless man exercises the will in the way of desiring and asking for it. So let not man think that he is his own saviour because he is not. And if the help did not come from without, he would never be saved from the condition which he finds himself in when he enters the spirit world. You hear in your spirit circles and read in the publications about spiritualism that progression is a law of the spirit world. Well, that is true, but it, is, but it does not mean that a spirit, by the mere fact of being a spirit, of being in the spirit world, necessarily progresses, either mentally or spiritually, for this is not true. Many spirits who have been here for years are in no better condition than when they first became spirits. Mm. All progression depends upon the help that comes from outside the mind or soul of a man. Of course, when this help comes, man has to cooperate. But without this help, there would be nothing with which to cooperate, and no progress could possibly be made. Many of the spiritualists make this great mistake when they speak or write on this subject. But let them know that if a man depends upon his own powers exclusively, he will never progress. And this law does not apply only to the soul's progress, of which you have heard us speak so often, but to the progress of the mere mind, and also to what might be called the purely moral qualities. My observation and my information from the other spirits that I have mentioned confirms the truth of what I have said. Man, of himself, cannot elevate himself either mentally or morally, and the sooner he learns that fact, the better for him. Wow, like that's... There's a lot in that. Yeah, what would you like to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just feel that this is such a fallacy, again, that most people um, carry this self-reliant feeling that it's up to me, I I'll get there. And, and a lot of, I, I see a lot of people having a lot of pride and arrogance about what they've learned and what they've achieved. And really what Salyards is saying here is that no man progresses anywhere without the help of other... Whether on the natural love path or the divine love path. Whether in spirit or on earth, no one gets anywhere without the help of other people. Of external people, of external things. Yeah. Mm. Um, so that's the big... The, the thing that I feel is so misunderstood on earth mm. and in the spirit world. Mm. And then there was another couple of things that I thought were highlighted just in that section when, as both of us were reading, is that desire the desire to grow and the asking for assistance are essential things mm. that we need to be able to grow. Yeah, it's interesting. I find on earth we almost naturally have this desire to grow and yet many people spiritually don't have the same desire. So physically and emotionally, people on earth generally have desires to grow, particularly physically with their mental growth. You mean like taking on learning or... Yeah, for uh, example, we, no people, not, not a single person would choose to go to university if they didn't have a desire to grow in a certain area yes. of learning. Yes. So this desire to grow is very present within them in that particular field. Mm -hmm. So you had to go to university to grow and learn the feelings, things about an occupational therapist, what, what an occupational therapist would do. I had to do that with computing. I learnt from somebody else. And you learn things from other people generally. And you learn things not only from other people, but there are other spirits that you actually learn from as well. And mm -hmm. there's all sorts of different uh, people assisting you in your learning that you often don't accept or know at the time. But, but what I feel is that when it comes to spiritual matters, 
people are very shut down towards learning anything. And once they do learn a certain type of thing with, with spiritual matter, they become very fixed and closed towards learning anymore. Mm. There's this concept that once you learn the truth, there's nothing else you need to learn when it comes to spirituality. And yet that same concept isn't put upon any of their physical learning. So, so the average person who goes to university and, and learns about, in, in your case, occupational therapy, doesn't think by the time they finished it that they know everything about occupational therapy. No. Like, in fact, such a proposition would be ludicrous <laughs> for them to think that they know everything from a four-year course. Uh, and, and so many people realise that when they're studying the human body, they're going to be learning the rest of their life, for example. Yeah. And yet they don't apply the same principle to their spiritual learning. They, with their spiritual learning, they go, oh, I've read the Bible, that's the truth, that's it, no more. Mm. Or I've read the Koran, that's the truth, that's it, there's no more. Uh, without considering, well, no, hang a sec, if, if learning your, about your body is, is something that's going to be spent probably the rest of your life doing, <laughs> then surely the same applies to learning about spiritual matters, mm. that there is no fixed spiritual truth. There is things that you use as a foundation that you build upon, but there is no fixed spiritual truth in the sense that you won't be constantly learning something new. And I, and I find this whole concept that people have with their spiritual life is very illogical compared to their physical life. Like the mm -hmm. physical life, they believe that, that they're going to keep, keep learning, keep learning, keep learning generally. You know, Even the most educated people on the planet um, generally keep learning. Yes. Right? So in their physical life, and in their intellectual life, they believe they're going to keep learning. But then on this, uh, when everybody engages their spiritual life, they think, oh, there's nothing to learn. Or, or that there is a fixed truth and there's nothing more that they can get after they've learned that particular fixed truth. Or it's all in one book. The... Or it's all in one book, which is totally illogical. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, you know, you can't even define in 2,000 pages what happens to your physical body. How could you ever define what's going to happen in the universe in 2,000 pages? Yes. Which is yeah. what, <laughs> around the, what the Bible is, depending on what kind of translation you have. And, and so you've got to ask yourself, well, well, if I have this concept that there is a fixed learning with my spiritual progress, and yet I at the same time have the concept that my physical learning is always going to continue, then how logical am I? <laughs> I'm not very logical yeah. if you think about it. Is, is that really, though, about fear and control, about people wanting to control people's... Uh, uh, spiritual development, basically. Yeah, so I feel that a lot of it is about um, people have this sort of concept. Well, they don't realise how much their emotions have an effect upon their their logical ability to absorb new information. So, so for example, the average person on the planet, when it comes to a university degree, wants to go to university and learn about their particular subject of choice. Mm -hmm. The average person on the planet will spend huge amounts of money doing that, mm. huge amounts of their time, four years of their life many times as a minimum mm -hmm. would be spent doing this. And so, you know, they have a huge investment in their, their own learning, developing their education. And yet at the same time, due to emotional constraints that they have, they do not have the same emotional attitude towards their spiritual learning. Mm. Now, a lot of it's because they don't believe they can learn anything spiritually or they don't believe the information is available spiritually, or they, or they believe that it's too hard to determine what is the truth, so, so you, you might as well wait until you go and, <laughs> yeah. and then work out what the truth is after you've gone. Yeah, I think a lot of people yeah. fall into that category. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which are all based around emotions of disillusionment about whether truth is uh, available to them on the planet. And what I'm saying is that, well, that doesn't make any logical sense really to do deal with those emotions, get rid of your disillusionment, get rid of your attitudes towards God, towards the universe in terms of the spiritual side of the universe. And once you get rid of all of those things, you'll want to absorb information about spiritual progression mm -hmm. as much as you wanted to absorb information about your physical or intellectual progression. Yeah. Mm. And I feel that mostly it is a limitations that we place on ourselves through our emotional condition. We, we sort of almost have this concept that, well, I'm in my physical life right now, so I can do things to engage the learning of my physical life, but I'm not in my spiritual life right now, which is false mm. concept. And so they don't engage anything that determines their spiritual life until such a time as it's forced upon them. And this is why 
so many spirits pa people pass into the spirit world and become spirits with no knowledge whatsoever. And this is why many of them are still wandering around in darkness in the spirit world because they didn't decide to develop this part of themselves that is an essential part of their future life. Mm. 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 Before we go on, did you want to make any comment about this idea that um, any progress that we make, spiritual or moral, we need to be assisted with? Yes, I, like every single person who's ever lived, as far as including myself on, the, on this planet, has all needed, have all needed to receive help from somewhere. Now, in my case, I learned how to connect to God, so therefore received help from God. If you don't connect to God, then you need to receive help from other people. Mm -hmm. I received assistance from a lot of spirits in my first century life. And they helped me to a certain point to understand all sorts of things that I could not have understood without their assistance. Yeah. And so this concept that, that, that you don't need help, which is driven by, I feel, a lot of self-reliance and arrogance, lack of humility, um, severely limits your future development. Mm. It's like I keep saying, this, it's interesting we don't have that concept generally with our mental development. You know, or with our musical development, or with our, you know, any of these things. I don't, but I don't we know. We seem to have this concept with our spiritual development. Yeah, I see a lot of people saying, "Yeah, I wrote this song," and yet if we really take this to to its, um, you know, deepest truth, no, you helped to write that song. Well, yeah, but but when they say I wrote this song, they had to learn the notes, they had to learn how to write it, they and all of those things they would freely admit. That they learn they, from, they learn somewhere from else. someone else. Yes, no, so, that's true. So they, yeah. so even in, the, in that example, yeah. they still learned a heap of things from someone else before they could actually write the song. Yeah, and they had to learn the notes. They had to learn the chords. They had to learn how it all fits together. They had to, learn, you know, lots of different yeah. things. Yeah, that they all got from someone else. Yeah, through through a process that they took themselves through because of their desire to do so. Yeah, it's very rare for somebody, and 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 whether that person was a person on earth or a spirit. You know, for many of the people who say, oh, nobody helped me, they've had a lot of spirits helping them. So they don't acknowledge the help that, they've been, that they have been receiving. Yeah. But the reality is for every single person on earth, in every single form of endeavour, in every way, they have been helped either from other people on earth or in the spirit world who are guiding them. Yeah. So they've all learnt something from someone else. Yeah. And then they go, oh, but I haven't, you know, like, and that's a denial in itself of the truth as well. Yeah. yeah, and I suppose I have this vision of like when when a person wherever they are suddenly has a desire and and opens to assistance. It's like all this help comes. All this help comes, yeah. and I think and that's where that statement, you know, when the, when the student is ready, the teacher will come. Yeah, and that is very true. Like it's pointless trying to teach somebody something <laughs> when they have no desire to learn yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> And, yeah. you know, a lot of people ask me questions like, well, why aren't you sharing this with, you know, this truth with these people and that people? And the, and the answer is quite plain. They have no desire to learn it. I'm going to share it with the people <laughs> that have a desire to learn it, not with other people who yeah. don't have a desire to learn it. Yeah. Why would you do such a thing? It's a pointless exercise. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I feel too this desire opens the heart to learning. Mm. And like even this, gen this statement that he just made that we've read, is a lot about humility in the sense that a person who desires to learn knows inside of themselves that they need to know something that they don't know. Yeah. Right? And this is really what he's saying here is that all of us need to come to terms with the fact that we don't know things and, and, we don't, and particularly when it comes to things about the spirit world. Most people have no knowledge of what's going on whatsoever, even when they think they do. Mm. And, uh, and we've had many examples of yes. that where people have emailed me with things and, or you with things and we've told them the truth of what's going on. They can't accept it because they want to believe something else. And, and this is all about this, the lack of humility, the lack of desire to experiment, the lack of desire to know um, causes a great deal of blockage to learning about spiritual matters. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Do you want to read the next sure. one, Beth? Another law of the spirit world is that when a spirit once commences to progress, that progress increases in geometrical progression, as we used to say when teaching on earth. I think the actual word that, uh, that he wanted um, Paget to use was 
exponential, exponential. progression. That's what I. But, uh, that's what I understood. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just as soon as the light breaks into a man's soul or mind, and he commences to see that there is a way for him to reach higher things and make greater expansion of either his mind or soul, he will find that his desire to progress will increase as that progression continues. And with that desire will come help in such abundance that it will be limited only by the desire of the spirit. His will then becomes a great force in his success in progressing and working in conjunction with the help that calls it into operation. It becomes a wonderful thing of power and irresistible force. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to keep going? Yeah, yeah. the next yeah. one sort of yeah. is an illustration that he uses to... Mm. Mm. The progression may be illustrated by the history of the snowball, which started rolling from the top of a hill. As it continues its descent, not only its velocity increase, not only does its velocity increase, but it continually enlarges its form and body by the outside snow attaching itself to the ball. So with the mind or soul of a spirit, as it ascends, it not only becomes more rapid in its flight, but it meets this outside help that I speak of, which help attaches itself to the spirit and, as it were, becomes a part of it. Mm. Yeah, my feelings on this uh, section is that this, this concept that the only thing that makes a person resistive to receiving information is their own personal resistance to receiving the information, <laughs> <laughs> their own will, the exercise of their own will. So while they can't will themselves out of their current condition, they can exercise their will to get to receive the help that is offered freely to mm. them to get them out of their condition. Yeah. And this is where I feel the majority of people who are, you know, in a, in a lack of, like a, a self-reliant and lack of humble state, an arrogant state, mm. they, what they do is they preclude the help that could be given them and then as a result of that remain in the condition that they currently are yeah. because there's no other way that th things can, can progress without them receiving the help that they need to be given to progress. And if they have a lack of desire to receive any help to progress, then there is no point whatsoever in helping them progress. Mm. Because in the end, they, their lack of desire will determine whether they're going to assimilate the information and act upon the information they hear. And I feel that's a big problem that we see on the planet. We see a general uh, self-satisfaction with information that people have inside of themselves about their spiritual life in particular, and a lack of a complete lack of desire to hear or know anything new. Yeah. And and so they are so resistive to hearing anything new. You you don't see it as much in the physical part of their life, although you still sometimes see it, mm. as you do in the spiritual part of their life. Mm. And I feel that's because many people have this strongly held belief system that you can't know. Yeah. And so therefore this belief that they can't know dictates their openness to knowing yeah. and therefore their lack of desire to know. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think that um, his statement that with that desire will come in such abundance, this help, that it's only limited by your own desire really. Mm. Now, if we look at that on earth as it is in heaven, in the mm. spirit world, um, I agree this, these issues of arrogance and self-reliance, this pride that I've done it on my own is really detrimental. But I feel like there's also these lot of feelings in people about asking for help mm -hmm. that it, of, uh, now I'll be obligated to them. I feel guilty. I feel unworthy. I feel like it makes me smaller if I ask for help from someone else. And mm -hmm. all these things... It, what Salyad's, I feel, is highlighting to me is all of the qualities that if I'm going to grow eternally, that I'm going to develop. And mm. they're, they're about understanding that God's laws govern my existence. Whether I want to see it or not, there's certain impermeable truths. Mm. And also that if I want to grow, I'll be humble enough to say I need help and to work towards that under God's way rather than, than my own. Yeah. yeah. 
And it, it is the people in the spirit world that you have the most difficulty helping are the people who believe they already know everything they need to know. Yeah. And showing a person a new thing is very, very a person who's in that condition, a new thing is very, very difficult. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes with our discussions we have with different spirits who come, some of them are pretty open to receiving something new because they, they've been hanging around for a while, you know, wanting to talk for a while. They have a strong desire to know. And then other ones who come are just, you know, so totally blocked to knowing anything new that your first thing you need to work on is showing them that there's a heap of things they don't know. <laughs> and, yeah. and instead of then criticising them for what they don't know, because, you know, I feel there's a lot of judgment on earth towards people who don't know things. Yes. Which causes people to feel humiliated or feel like they, you know, are going to be humiliated by admitting that they, that need they help. don't know. Yeah. And, and this has happened a lot in people's childhoods, I feel, too, that where, you know, whenever they didn't know something or, or misunderstood something, their parents berated them or someone at school berated them. And so they've grown up now with this fear of, anybody noticing that they don't know something <laughs> and whereas one of the best uh, things to come to discover is that you are a perennial student you know that you're always going to be a student of God and so therefore you're always not going to know things like you know I'm, I realized that myself that I don't know a lot of things that I'd mm -hmm. like to know and and as a result of that you, you will keep discovering you will keep searching you'll keep wanting to know and therefore get the assistance but if your heart's already closed to the assistance, when someone comes along and says, oh, do you realise that what you believe about that is false? You go, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, no, it's not. It's not false. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. I can't listen to you, you know. Yeah. Or, and then if you impose a lot of religious beliefs on it, you're just from the devil now because you're yes. trying to convince me something different. And the person's just got a loving feeling towards you of wanting to show you something positive. But you're not even going to see that. Yeah. You're only going to see what your fixed position wants you to see. Yeah. And this is why it's so important to understand the power of our emotional condition upon our future life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and um, what I was going to say earlier as well is that if I understand that um, help's going to come to me in huge abundance if I really truly desire it, mm -hmm. if I say I'm asking for help and I'm not getting really, it, really? then that's showing me something about the quality of my desire. Exactly. It's yeah. a proof that, that you don't have any real desire. Yeah. Proof. I want, help yeah. me, help me, help me, help me, help me, but I don't yeah. actually want to receive. I just am in a state of panic or yeah. I want reassurance rather than to actually shift. Yes. Yeah. 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 So we need to let ourselves work through that emotionally, don't yeah. we, to get to a yeah. point where we yeah. change with that. Aside from that, it's really exciting, isn't it? The idea of this snowballing effect that once we get rolling, mm. it's going to like yeah. support itself. Our growth will support itself to continue growing. As long as their desire continues to yeah. be present, yeah. you will always get the help you need yeah. at different times to grow. Yeah. And, and, but a lot of the times we notice even people come to us and ask us specific questions about their growth. We tell them the truth about them. They reject those truths. Yeah. So, so most of the time they reject them. And so you know straight away that there's not a really sincere desire. What they want instead is to be told what they believe they need to be told. You know, that's what they want instead, which is not a sincere desire yeah. to grow. Yeah. Um, so if we have a truly sincere des desire to grow and we've gone to ask somebody a question, we will listen to their answer and truly consider it in, and also attempt to perhaps put it into practice. If we really had a desire to grow, we'd at least attempt that. Yeah. We wouldn't dismiss it out of hand just because our belief systems are completely different to what the person is saying. Yeah. We wouldn't do that. Yeah. We, we would have to go through a process to do that. We'd have to know by experience that their belief is incorrect before we would reject it. And really, if we're in a state in our life where there's there's unhappiness, there's dissatisfaction. If we really look at it logically, we're going to have to change a belief system somewhere. Obviously. Because our, our life is a result of our beliefs. Yes. And so um, to think that we can hold on to our beliefs and change spiritually or even physically, yeah. it's, it's not logical, yeah. like you said earlier. Yeah. Our yeah. logic is smart. Yeah. Okay. So where are we up to? Just, oh, uh, yes. Yep. So, so you see it. that the great problem is to make the start. And this principle will apply to mortals as well as to spirits because if the start be made on earth, the mere fact of becoming a spirit will not halt or in any way interfere with the progress of the soul of that spirit. 
of the, of course, this means that a correct start be made. Mm -hmm. If the start be a false one or based on things other than the truth, instead of progressing, continu progress continuing when the man becomes a spirit, there may have to be a retracting of the way and a new start made in order to get onto the right road. And this applies to the progress of the mind as well as to the progress of the soul. The mind of a mortal learns many things which seem to that mind to be the truth and which in its opinion must lead to progress and greater knowledge. But when the earth life gives place to the spirit life, that mind may find that its basis of knowledge were all wrong and that to continue in the way that it had been moving would lead to increased error and consequently a new start must be made. And frequently the retracting of that mind over the course that it had followed and the elimination of the errors that it had embraced is more difficult and takes a longer time to accomplish than the learning of the truth does after the mind makes its correct start. So sometimes the mind of great learning, according to the standards of earthly learning, is more harmful and retards more the progress of that man in the ways and acquirements of truth than does the mind that is, as you might say, a blank, that is, without preconceived ideas of what the truth is on a particular subject. Mm. Yes, now I feel this is like an important section mm -hmm. where people... Uh, and, and I feel this also creates a lot of fear in people yeah. because they, they many times throughout our life on earth we progress down a certain way of investigation and there, again it's rarely a physical way of investigation it's usually a spiritual way of investigation yeah. that this happens to and this yeah. is why I feel people have a lot of fear about spiritual yeah. investigation yeah. is because they progress down a certain way of spiritual investigation only to find at the end of it that they believe that it doesn't that it's not correct anymore and then they re have to rewind all the false beliefs that they've imbibed yeah. in the process. The beauty of assimilating truth is that you don't have to rewind anything. Yeah. And therefore you don't have to go through all of these terrible you know, processes of rewinding what you've learned. Now there are many people who have, been, have listened to the stuff that we've taught and then who now believe it to be true, not true. Mm -hmm. But when you ask them, what don't you believe to be true of what we've taught? When it gets down to it, the only thing they don't believe to be true is my identity generally yeah. <laughs> and the rest of it they still have accepted. And this is an interesting uh, thing about truth is that with truth you will not be able to get rid of it generally once you've imbibed it, yeah. once you've actually believed it inside of your heart and gotten rid of the emotional impediments to believing something. One, if it is the truth, you will not have the rewinding process. Mm -hmm. So the only thing, and, and I put to people who, who, have, who now don't want to listen to what I present after they have listened, I put to them the only thing they can't accept is my own identity and mm. perhaps yours. Everything else we've taught, they've generally accepted. So it doesn't make much sense their decision to stop doing it just based on this one thing that they have not been able to yet accept or have proven to them as fact. So I feel even that is, a, is an interesting thing regarding people's progression on earth and in the spirit world. Just because you don't want something or have never dealt with a certain doubt, it doesn't mean that, it's still, that your doubt is true. Yeah, and it's only fear that drives doubt and yes. it's only a lack of humility which causes us to live in doubt and not just experience our fears which will lead us to certainty in one way or another. Yes. It may, but when we, we hold on to doubt, it's actually an avoidance of humility. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But, uh, sorry, go ahead. Go on. Oh, I was just going to say that um, this, this idea of retracing the steps... Um, a lot of people do have a lot of pain about that, don't they? And mm. of having trusted something. Uh, only to later only find to, out. To later find out that it wasn't trustworthy. Mm -hmm. But as you were talking, I was thinking about um, what we teach. And I feel that if, if one engages it with their heart, there's very little risk because there's not, there's not the um, onus on people to believe everything that we're saying. There's no, uh, and there's no strict um, 
laws or rules or anything that anyone must comply with. It's all an experiment. Mm -hmm. And we are ourselves engaged in an experiment mm -hmm. um, in this growing back towards God in mm -hmm. a state where we feel we've lost that connection. Mm -hmm. um, so people witness our growth as well and they witness me make stuff ups and do silly things and all those kinds of things um so that it's a much more we're trying to demonstrate a way of living rather than and that there any, doesn't have to be so much judgment about mistakes exactly, as there currently is exactly yeah, yeah. but also and, this uh, this rewinding um thing i feel one reason why people experience a lot of pain when they have to rewind is because they've invested a lot of their life in it being true before they've actually felt it to be true. Yeah. And that's and this what I, I was this getting is, to. Yeah. yeah. This is what I feel is a major problem, is that you can see how much people investigate something. They they actually act like it's true when they don't yet believe it's true. And, and it's a very da dangerous thing to do. This yeah. is why I've said to people, a lot of people have said to me, oh, I believe you, Jesus. And I go, no, you don't at all. <laughs> you don't believe it at all. Yeah. And it's fine that you don't. Yeah. But don't come to me saying that you do when I know that I can feel inside of you that something will come along that I'll say in the future and it annoys you or makes you, it makes you angry or afraid. And, and, and the next day you'll say, oh, he's not Jesus because he said that, you know. Yeah. And, and to me, it, it is an indication that they haven't yet resolved what they believe they've resolved. Yep. And I feel that a lot of people do that with all sorts of religious studies. They believe they've resolved something that they haven't actually resolved. And yes. therefore, you know, when they, 20 years later, when they actually do resolve it, they look back at the last 20 years as a, as a waste, as a mistake. Because really they have been ignoring their own soul's promptings. And exactly. this, is, this is what I was getting to was that I feel that if... If people would just engage with one aspect of what we teach and just like engage in an experiment with it and decide if it's truth or not and then decide to take that part of the teaching into their lifestyle and live by that, yeah. that I feel is what we are preaching or yeah. endorsing, yeah. you know. Yeah. And when I see people go, right, I've got all the, you know, I've got all the, the talks, the, all the, <laughs> the laws, yeah. I, I'm doing that and I can't do that and I'm going to, and they, they begin to create a set of rules mm -hmm. to live by, none of which have entered their heart no. and they haven't and even it's established. it's quite plain generally. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I feel quite um, concerned for those people because I feel you're actually repeating an old pattern, which is just to take on something because of another unhealed emotion within yourself, exactly. to try to live by it. Yep. And you're in danger of feeling regret because you might come up against something that you go, I don't believe that. Yep. And, and then it won't be because we said you should. Yep. <laughs> we said you should, you should really decide if you believe it in your heart or not. Yep. And but the decision in the heart too is dictated by, it's not an intellectual process, it's yeah. dictated by the emotional condition of the heart. Yeah. And so this is where I feel most people get confused. They, they listen to a lot of divine truth and they can ex the, the stuff they can accept is completely because they already have a bit of a yeah, heart open okay. to accepting it. Yeah. That's the only stuff they accept. Yeah. The rest of the stuff they don't accept. Yeah. And they don't really accept it. And, and, and it's only when some critical thing happens in their life that it's really confronted that they then have a decision in their heart to make mm. about whether they're going to really accept this truth or not. Yeah. So, so, for example, the average person when they're in an argument will fight back quite strongly and will yell and scream and be abusive and all those kind of things even after they've learned the truth. Why is that? It's because they haven't accepted the truth in their heart yet. That, yeah. that this feeling that's driving their anger is driven by some fear inside of themselves that if they were truly acknowledging this fear, this anger wouldn't be present. And so um, they need to allow themselves to see that. So every time I get angry, I don't go, oh, it's all your fault I'm angry. I go, wow, there's another thing that I don't get inside yeah. of my heart here yeah. because I, otherwise I wouldn't be getting angry at all. Yeah. And, and I feel that's the big problem, that people still believe that they can intellectually grow on the divine love path, and it's impossible. Yeah. It's totally impossible. And, and then when it comes to a critical point, such as, oh, is he really Jesus or not? For mm. many of them, that's the critical point. They go, no, I don't believe he's Jesus because he said this to me, and I don't agree with that, and I don't agree with this, and I don't agree with that, and, you know, he doesn't talk to me now because, I, you know, he, oh, 
you know, I've been angry with him in the past and he said, I'm not having your anger much anymore. Jesus wouldn't do that. And so they have all these belief systems that they then, they then impose upon their situation and, and then go down this track of, oh, I can't listen to anything now. Mm. Um, And, and that is an indication that very little of what has actually been said to them that they've actually heard over many years in many cases Mm. has entered their heart. Mm. Because even their own, if they had some self-awareness, they'd be going, wow, yeah, he warned me that actually I'd feel like this at some point in the future. Yeah. (laughs) And and that obviously there's got to be some things I need to work through here with that. Yeah. Um, He even told me that that was going to happen in my life, which I have told almost everyone we've ever met. And so, so... I feel that, you know, these principles of, of learning truth, I feel that there is this sort of idea or concept still on the earth that you can learn the truth intellectually, and, uh, but you don't have to have an emotional change. Mm. And what I, what I feel here is that while it is true that you can learn intellectual truth intellectually, mm-hmm. there has to be some emotional openness to learning this truth before it can enter you anyway. Mm. And if... if if it, if it doesn't enter you, then it hasn't, there has not been an emotional openness. There's just an intellectual thought. Yeah. And I feel this is a big problem that most people face still yeah. listening to us. Yeah. There's still this big problem that most people believe that they can hear all the words and put it into practice without their heart actually changing. Yeah. Mm. yeah and the other thing that he's saying here, though, is that it's important to make a good start. Uh, and yeah. really... Um, and all good starts we, start with love, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with yeah. love. Humility. Truth, as as we incarnate. Mm. And so for a lot of us, there's going to be a lot of retracing anyway, just based around our beliefs around love, even if we don't um, look at God or who we are or, or, whether, or any of or those whether, things. Or what is the truth spiritually. Yeah, just, just there is... And I suppose what I felt when I read this was like, yeah, wow... Having a child, <laughs> you're giving them a start, and to make a good start with that child, what a gift that would be. Yes, and unfortunately, most of us make a bad start yeah. because of the definitions of love that are present on the planet. Yeah, and as a result of that, we have to retrace all of our steps when it yeah. comes to what we believe love to be. Yeah, yeah. and that's going to involve pain, letting yeah. go of all those false beliefs that are in us now. Yeah. yeah. And the pain's going to be emotional. It's not something we can go, oh, I'll let go of that now, I'll let go of that without there being any emotional <laughs> yes. response. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, yeah, I feel this idea of uh, having no preconceived ideas of what the truth is on. He's not suggesting that there is no truth. No. See, a lot of people have no preconceived idea because they have this philosophy that you can't know the truth, so it's pointless having a preconceived idea. And ironically, that is a preconceived idea of the fact, you know, they're having a preconceived idea that there is no truth. <laughs> and also... <laughs> or, or, or that you can never know it. Yeah. yeah. Also, I find most people who are large proponents of the idea that there is no one truth have a lot of pain in them about having yep. been confronted with supposedly contradictory things, wanting to believe in something, fi- going through this process of finally saying, that's it, there is no truth. Yeah. So they actually have a lot of baggage and about And a lot of truth. anger about yeah. their pr- past life sex, you know, process of having to rewind every yes. time. Which is very different to the three-year-old in a high chair going, mummy, what's that? Yeah. Now, there's no preconceived idea of truth in that. Yeah. And that's the... The, the difference in The learning. difference, yeah, yeah. 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 This unfortunate... Uh, is it my turn to read or yours? Oh, I can't remember. must be yours, you I think. Uh, yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. This unfortunate experience exists to a greater extent in matters pertaining to religion than to any other matters. Because the ideas and convictions which are taught and possessed of these religious matters affect innumer- innumerably more mortals than do ideas and convictions in reference to uh, any other matters. A spirit who is filled with these erroneous beliefs that may have been taught from taught him from his mortal childhood or fostered and fed upon by him until he becomes a spirit is, of all the inhabitants of this world, the most difficult to teach and convince of the truths pertaining to religious matters. It is much easier to teach the agnostic or even the infidel of these truths than the hide-bound believer in the dogmas and creeds of the church. 
should, should I continue? Or? I think that's... You want to say something about it? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's pretty self-explanatory. I think so. I, I feel this is... He points out correctly, again, this concept that we have this problem with religious matters more than we have it with any mm. other thing. Mm. Where religious things, we have this concept... We don't have this concept with other matters that we know everything. Mm. But with religious things... The amount of religious people you meet who have this concept that they know everything and there's nothing you can share and nothing you can teach them, it is so huge. There's a, the, just about every person you reach of a certain religious denomination has that belief. And yet, logically, it makes no sense to have this belief. Yeah. It makes no sense because you don't have this belief in any other thing. So why would you have this belief that you know everything about spiritual matters when it's quite obvious that even if you've been to university five times over, you still don't know everything about a certain subject that you're learning in a physical matter. Yeah. So, so why would you believe that because you spent a whole life studying the Bible that you now know everything, know there, everything is know. there is to know about spiritual matters? It, it does not make any logical sense whatsoever. It's not logical. And, and the problem is, of course that when they pass into the spirit world, the level of conviction that they have about their belief systems is so great that there's no desire whatsoever to know anything new. Yeah. And because there's no desire, there's no help that you can give. Yeah. There's no, no help that a person can give, be given until they exercise their desire to know something new. Yeah. And, and if we look historically, like people who've tried to make changes in spiritual movements have you know, change to like change internally inside of their church or create a new religion or even challenge the church power in the society. Mm -hmm. They have met with massive opposition, haven't they? Yeah. Because there is this feeling that no, this is immovable, these truths and yes. this way. And, and then they use the devil as an excuse and punishment by God as <laughs> yes. an excuse to not even look at anything logically. Which is, a, which is, again, a very destructive thing to do to the soul of the person who's involved in this kind of a religion. And do you think that is because, going back to what we said at the start, everyone's so afraid of death. So they want certainty and they want to know. And, and so there's this huge investment in holding on to these beliefs. Do you feel that that's why? I don't think it's just afraid of death. They're afraid of eternal damnation, damnation. Yeah. which is, for many people who are Christian, worse than death. Yeah. And for many people who are Muslim. Worse, worse than, than death. death. Yeah. So, you know, they're, they're very afraid to change their belief systems. I also believe that the, one of the main reasons why people are afraid to change their belief systems is to do with family, friends and, and their social life. Yeah. In the sense that, you know, if I no longer have the same belief system as you, then we might have a lot less to talk about yeah. and there we, therefore we might spend less time together and, and then it will feel like I've lost a friend. So rather than lose a friend, uh, I would rather... Um, remain in the in the religious faith that I mean even if I don't necessarily agree with everything it's got to yeah, say that's... and I see most people doing that with religion there are many people that I see still practicing their faiths only because of the company it brings them and also because of the uh, fear of attack they have if they if they mention anything that's out of harmony with their faith yeah. or live a life that appears to be out of harmony with the faith of others in their family or their friends. And so, yeah, I feel that's a big impediment as well. Yeah. yeah. Would you like to read just the next little paragraph? Yeah. And then... So I say, let the minds of mortals be open to the teachings of truth. And even if they are convinced that what they believe is the truth, yet let not that belief stand in the way of them being able to see the truth when it is actually presented to them. Mm. Yeah, this is what I feel is the big problem um, that we see in religious spiritual movements on the planet. Yeah. Once they've presented a certain truth that they believe for a period of time is the truth, there is no, there is no willingness whatsoever to even contemplate or listen to any other potential truth. Yeah. And this is a, it, it creates, in fact, a lack of humility in these people but it also creates this uh, state of personal arrogance where they believe, I know the truth, you can't tell me anything now. And, and it's a very logical state. It makes no sense from a logical mm -hmm. perspective. But, but because their emotions are involved in retaining their belief systems, there is huge amounts of resistance to any new belief system 
that yeah. is presented. And this is, it's really a lesson in humility again, isn't it? If mm -hmm. we're humble to whatever, whatever new thing is presented to us, if I'm humble to what, I, what emotions that brings up in me, then I'll be able to discern, is this truth, is this loving, is this... And, and most people are just not, do not have, they have, as you said, so much investment mm -hmm. that they don't want to feel the fear or the anger or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah very yeah. much so. Yeah. Okay, so let's go on to the next law. Another law is that not all who know that life in the spirit world is continuous are certain that continuous life means immortality. Mm -hmm. I mean by this that the mere fact of living as a spirit does not of itself prove that such a spirit is immortal. This is a subject that spirits discuss as much as do mortals, and probably more so actually, yeah. I would think. <laughs> and it is just as much a question of uncertainty as is the immortality of the soul as taught among mortals now and for all ages past. While men know that the death of the body does not mean the death of the spirit, and that such spirit, which is the real man, continues to live with all its qualities of a spiritual nature, yet there has never been any proof presented to man that a spirit will live for all eternity, or in other words, that it is immortal. I say this because I have read the histories and beliefs of most of the civilised and some not called civilised nations of the world, and I was not able to find in all my readings that it was ever demonstrated that man is immortal. Of course, many pagan and sacred writers taught this, but their statements were all based on belief and nothing more. And so I say, immortality has never to mortals become demonstrated as a fact. Mm. Now, of course, he clarifies that statement a bit later. But here he's talking about this, this idea that many spiritualists have that because there is no such thing as death, that you continue to exist, that that means that mankind is immortal. is mm. not a very, very like, logical reasoning either. Immortality requires that we will never be able to die in the future, whereas living eternally, there is the possibility of death or, or some f form of change in the future still. Yeah. Now, we don't, just because we have passed off a physical body and entered a spiritual one, it doesn't mean that we know for certain that the spiritual one might not cease at some point in the future. Yeah. So there is no proof that just because we have passed off a material body to a spiritual one, that that proves that, that we are immortal. All it proves is that we have a lot longer life than the mortal then, existence. Than we perhaps perceived before we passed. Exactly. Yeah. That's all it proves. It doesn't yeah. establish immortality. Immortality can only be established by by the fact that you cannot die. Yeah. Not, not may not, but cannot. Yeah. And whereas a person who, uh, who, who has just passed from earth into the spirit world may still die. We don't know. Mm -hmm. There's no truth. There is no way of discovering what may happen in the future. Change is an immutable thing in God's universe. Yeah. So it would make sense that people who do not receive God's love may still have to change in some way. Yeah. And who knows what that change may be? Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. Um, however, someone who has received God's love now cannot ever die. And so therefore they are immortal because for, for them to die, God's love would have to die, and which is an impossibility. Yeah. So now they have demonstrated to them as a feeling and as emotion that they are immortal. Mm. 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 Okay. You want to read the next? Mm -hmm. um, uh, while men know, is that the next? In the bit? spirit world. Uh, oh, sorry. Well, uh, where are we up to? Uh, is this where we are? Oh, no, I was down to uh, uh, there. Oh, yeah. In the spirit world, the spirits of not only the lower spheres, but those of the higher intellectual or moral spheres, are still debating the question among themselves. I'm informed that there, that there are some who lived on earth many centuries ago and who have become exceedingly wise and learned in the knowledge of the laws of the universe and have become so free from the sins and errors of their earth life that they may be called perfect men and yet they do not know that they are immortal. Many of them think that they are just such men or spirits as were they who were represented by Adam and Eve. They know not that they are any less liable to death than were the ones just mentioned. And hence, immortality is a thing which may or may not exist for spirits as well as for mortals. 
I know that many of your spiritualist friends on earth claim that the mere fact that spiritualism has demonstrated the continuity of life establishes the fact of immortality. But a few moments of consideration will show you the falsity of this reasoning. Change is the law eternal, both on earth and in the spirit world, and nothing exists the same for any length of time. And in the succession of these changes, how can it be said that in the future, far or near, changes may not come by which the existence of the spirit, the ego of man, may be ended, and that ego may take some other form or enter into some other condition, so that it will not be the same ego and not the same spirit which is now living as a demonstration of the continuity of life. And so many spirits, as well as mortals, do not know what is necessary to obtain to have the certain knowledge of immortality. So, so here he's just sort of elucidating more about the subject of immortality. Yeah. And, and it is uh, like, uh, as both of us know from our own life in the spirit world, it is a huge discussion amongst spirits up yeah. until the sixth dimension, not understanding, you know, there's this... Because, of course, there's this threat, if you think, think of it as a threat. It's not really a threat. But the fact is that change has been required to get the person to go to the sixth dimension in the first place. They had to change. Mm-hmm. And when their changes stop, they then become really, really concerned because they realise that everything is changing around them, but they're not changing. Yeah. And then they become quite, in some ways, the reason why there's this discussion of immortality in the sixth dimension of the spirit world so much is because they become quite frightened in some ways yeah. because they realise that everything around them is changing, but they're not changing. And they know that everything around them changing means that in God's universe, everything is changing. Yep. And then they become very, very concerned that if they are not changing, then it means that something is wrong. Yep. And, uh, and this is what um, they often consider. So that in the sixth dimension of the spirit world, there's like huge universities focused just on the question of immortality. And there's many philosophers uh, using their very developed minds trying to come up with what, how, you know, they can go beyond this particular state and yet they were completely resistive to how to go beyond the state by receiving love from God. Uh, they want to come to some other kind of conclusion, uh, which is, again, a lack of humility, yeah. a lack of uh, being taught something new that you personally, in your intellect, d- feels too simple to, yeah. to, understand, to, to actually put into practice. So, you know, I just feel that it's a big issue in the spirit world and, and it's a big issue here on earth because if all of us believed we were immortal and knew that we were immortal in our hearts, we would never choose to take a damaging action towards another person ever in our entire existence. It's only the lack of belief inside of our soul that we are more immortal that causes us to act in fear with regard to events that happen around us. Mm. So you're saying that the the root cause of all of our harmful actions towards others is the fear of death? Or is the, the fear, fear of, of not being immortal. So could you explain that a little bit more? Well, the fear of death, uh, you know, there are many religious people who, who, who do not have a fear of death, yeah. but they still act in ways that are out of harmony with love in mm-hmm. their life. Mm-hmm. And the reason why is because they fear that they are not immortal, I believe. Well, I don't understand what you mean by that, well, by immortal you th- in that sense. Well, immortal means that you can never die. Yeah. Whereas, whereas eternal life means that you have the possibility of dying at some point in the future. You mm-hmm. have the possibility of changing into yep. something different at some point in the future. Now, for most people, they don't even consider that immortality is available after their earth life. So in other mm-hmm. words, they are totally afraid of death. So, so they don't have any firm idea and definitely no firm emotional idea, you know. Mm-hmm. They might have an intellectual idea, but they're scared stiff of yep. death. And, and, and as a result, they're scared stiff of pain that may cause death. They're scared of dying. They, they, they often fight for their life or the mm-hmm. life of others because of this fear of death. Yep. So that drives their unloving behaviour, yes. the majority of it, in fact. For others who believe there is an afterlife, it is their false beliefs about that afterlife that drive their continuing to act out of harmony with love. So, for example, the average Christian has a false belief that only Christians will ever become 
you know, God's favoured people. Yeah. Jews have the same belief, ironically, that only Jews will become God's favoured people. Muslims have the same belief too, that okay. only Muslims will become the, you know, favoured persons of God and that everyone else will have some other different thing. So it's their fear of some future condition that is limited mm -hmm. that causes them to continue, even if they have a belief, to continue acting out of harmony with love. Now, if they believed in their own immortality, if they knew they were immortal in their heart, they would never have that fear of any future belief, mm -hmm. of any future state, because they know they actually know they're immortal. It's a feeling not through, not through a belief, but through knowledge of a certainty. Yeah. Now, once they have that, they would never be afraid of some future change, such as hell. They would never be afraid of some negative thing that might happen in the future that would cause them, that, or, or judgment that might happen in the future as a result. So the crux of most people's false choices, yeah. out of harmony with love, come from this really, really deep ingrained feeling in them that they may be not immortal. And that is a truth. Without God's love entering the soul, we are not immortal. Yeah. And that underlying truth should help us come to some other you know, to, to, to some other knowledge. And I feel, in fact, God has placed this feeling inside of us that we are not immortal in order for us to seek God's love, mm. in order to trigger us into seeking God's love, mm -hmm. um, and in order to help us reflect upon the fact that we've, we're still in a state where we're not certain of our future. And, but really you're saying because of that, that feeling God's put in us to trigger us towards growth actually causes people to be unloving because they're not humble to well, that Well, it's feeling. their lack of humility that to that feeling, yep. to actually allowing themselves to feel the feeling that I am not immortal. In my current state, I am not immortal is the feeling that most people have. Mm -hmm. They then know, whether it's on earth or in the spirit world, that there will be some future change that may, they may not like. Yes. Right? And they are f worried about that. They're scared or frightened about that. Yep. And if they let themselves feel their fear about that, they would realise that they're not at one with God and they're not, you know, they're, they're not in a state where they completely know their future. Mm -hmm. And if they realise that, then they'd be a lot more humble to knowing what their future could be. Right. Whereas what I feel what happens for most people is they want to go through this concept you know, that they believe they have immortal existence. They want to hold on to that, but their very life demonstrates to them that they don't believe it because they're afraid of death or, in the case of many believers of spiritual past, they're afraid of some future change. Mm. They're afraid of all sorts of future, potential future changes. Mm. And who knows that the, that the people who do not receive divine love may at some point in the future become an unindividualized Mm. entity of some kind yeah we don't know yeah and that's this underlying feeling inside of them that they don't know should drive them to a desire for more truth yeah and and unfortunately for many people it doesn't and also this underlying feeling that i don't know while i'm trying to suppress it it drives me into unloving behavior in my future whether that unloving behavior is happens on earth or in the spirit in world spirit at some world. point in my future mm. 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 Okay. So it's a very big issue, I feel, much bigger than most people on the planet actually have an awareness of, this yeah. issue of immortality. And immortality can only come, as he explains now, through the reception of divine love into the soul. Now, if people could feel that they're not immortal in their soul, they would seek the divine love. Yeah. But many people, they want to ignore the fact that they feel that they're not immortal. Mm. They want to ignore, and even spirits, many spirits are ignoring it too. Yeah. Okay. It matters not whether they're on earth or in the spirit world. They are still ignoring the feeling. Yeah. Now, for many people on earth, they use the certainty of death as a fear that supports their feeling. Yeah. In other words, they know that they're going to die. They don't have a very fixed idea of what will happen after they die. So they know they're mortal, right? And they don't know that they're immortal. Yeah. And so many people were so afraid that their actions become very negative and unloving as a result because of Because they're trying to avoid death. Basically. They're trying to avoid death. Yes. We, but many spirits are trying to avoid the knowledge that they're not immortal. Mm. They, they don't realise that they are not, they don't want to know, in fact. 
And this is why there are whole huge schools of, uh, dedicated to the subject yeah. in the spirit world because there are huge numbers of spirits who still have no idea that they could. That, that, you well, know, they that, don't uh, want to feel the idea that they could die, basically. Well, no, they, they, no, they do feel the idea that they could die because they have become stagnant. Yeah. And, they, and they're confused as to the idea of immortality. So now one of the primary things that they're seeking in the sixth dimension of the spirit world is knowledge of immortality. Mm. Ironically, when the celestial spirits come and tell them how to become immortal, they don't believe that. They, so they, in their own self-reliance, try to find knowledge of immortality using some other technique, yeah. which they never discover. Mm. And many spirits have done this for ten, tens of thousands of years in the spirit world still seeking knowledge of their own immortality because they know that they're not immortal yeah. inside of themselves. And I feel, you know, this underlying feeling drives a lot of their also unloving, what, what I classify to be their unloving behaviour in a sense. They're perfectly loving to humankind, so they've become the perfected man, but they're still quite unloving in their relationship with God in the sense that they have no desire to connect to God. Yeah. So, so, you know, it drives a lot of this behaviour. They, they are frightened of the knowledge that they are not immortal. Mm. Mm -hmm. they, mm. they know it as a truth that they are not immortal. Uh, and they, they are looking for ways to become immortal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And this is some of the people that Salyans is talking about in the, in the yeah. message. Yeah, and some of them These... even try to reincarnate, trying to become immortal. And they try all sorts of things to become immortal and... None of them are successful, of course. Yeah, mm. yeah, okay. Mm. Where are we up to? Okay, when a spirit... Uh, sorry. I've lost my place. Um, uh, I know. It's right at the top of the page, yes. isn't it, that we finished off. Changes the law... We have, that's We've right. said changes the law eternal, and yeah. so many spirits... So, it's but, but many yep. other spirits, if you can read for me. But many other spirits know that there is an immortality for spirits who choose to seek that immortality in the way that God, in his great wisdom and providence, has provided. I will not discuss this phase of immortality now, but will at some, time, at some later time. Yeah. There is another law which enables spirits to become, by the mere operation of their natural affections and loves, pure and free from the consequences and evils of their mortal lives and again become perfect like the first parents before the fall. This does not mean that the law of compensation does not operate to the fullest and that it does not demand the last farthing because such is the exactness in the operation of this law that no spirit is released from its penalties until he has satisfied the law. As you believe, and as many other mortals believe, a man's punishment for the sins committed by him on earth are inflicted by his conscience and memories. There is no special punishment inflicted by God on any particular man, but the law of punishment operates alike on every man. If the facts that bring that punishment into operation are the same, that punishment will be the same no matter whether the object of its infliction be the same or different persons. So you see it cannot be escaped on the ground of any special dispensation so long as the facts which call for its operation exist and the conscience and memories of the spirit realise these facts. Mm. So now he's discussing the law, law of, of compensation, compensation, basically, and he's discussing how it operates. And this is, what I feel, one... Again, one thing that is not known on this planet, even among spiritualists, is the importance of understanding the law of compensation. Most spiritualists will talk about it, but they have no understanding of what it operates upon and how it operates at all. Yeah. And in fact, I've been to many spiritualist churches uh, over, the, over the time of my life. And, uh, and of course, we've had the chance, both of us, to have many you know, engagements with people on earth over 2,000 years of life. And still there's this deep misunderstanding in, on earth about the law of compensation, mm. let alone the laws of divine love and forgiveness. The law of compensation is, is a greatly misunderstood law. And in fact, if people on earth understood it much better, they would be making very different decisions yes. when they're on yes. earth than what they are currently yes. making. 
Yeah. yeah, and I feel that when you connect to the truth of the law of compensation, holy Toledo, it <laughs> makes you really like uh, consider your actions very, because it is, as he says, down to the last farthing yeah. of what motivated you and the, the pain that you caused in the other person. Yeah. God requires that you that you not only acknowledge it, but you feel it and you know it. Yeah. What was going on for you and what it caused in the other person, and yeah. that that has repercussions not just to the person that you directly harm, but what they did as what a result they did of that as a harm, choice, choices, and yeah. on and on. It's yeah. like a huge ripple effect. Yeah. Um, and God is saying, yes, yes, you need to look at that. Yeah. That has impacted on your soul, and that's preventing your love from being pure. Yeah, I feel that most people who come along to our seminar still have no understanding of the ripple effect of their actions yeah. upon others. Yeah. They've got no understanding of how just one little choice that they made, one little statement they made, had a huge ripple effect on others, um, so much so that others made choices in their life as a result of these effects. And they've got no knowledge of the choices that they're making and how they're affecting other people. Yeah. And I think some of them are starting to gain an awareness about how their choices affect their children, but very little effect, uh, knowledge of how their choices affect everyone around them. And people in other countries, like people mm -hmm. in Africa right now, are having a ripple effect of our choices in the Western world. So, you know, we, we, we just have no knowledge of these things. And... And once we become aware that it demands this law of compensation, demands the last farthing, so there is no punishing God because God doesn't need to punish at all. Like no. the law demands its, it, its price, if yeah. you like. Whenever we break it, it demands its price. And, and the law will refine us. Yes. Whether we are, and the law Willing of comp not. compensation is all about unwilling re refinement. Yeah. And usually, you know, it's the law of compensation that is engaged in our life. When we are completely unwilling to be refined by God directly, the law of compensation is the law that is refining us. Yeah. And, uh, and sooner or later, everyone on this planet needs to come to terms with this law. Most never come to terms with it except when they arrive in the spirit world. And then they arrive in the spirit world in places of confusion and darkness and it takes them many, many years even to understand why they're there. Yeah. Because, and once they begin to understand why they're there, then they realise every single thing that I have ever done in my life that has affected another person and has affected another person in a negative direction is something that I, my soul, will need to compensate for at some point in the future unless I'm, uh, I'm repentant. Yeah. And I like what Salyard says. Is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter your personal circumstances. It doesn't matter what excuses you've got. It doesn't matter what caused you to do the thing. No. There, God. Who taught you to do it. It doesn't matter if, whatever. If you took the same action as somebody else or if the condition in your heart was the same as somebody else, yep. then God is, God's law is going is it, to work. It operates upon the same conditions the same way at the same time with different people. Yeah. So every single time. Yeah. And I have this feeling about the law of compensation that God is working on the error in the universe everywhere. Yeah. God is, all, all his laws are trying to bring it into correction. Well, and, and, and all the error does not exist as a result of God. It not at all. It exists as a result, a result of mankind exercising his will in error. Yes. So, so God's laws, the whole universe frame, universal framework is about pulling man's exercise of his will into, into harmony with love. And, and if a person resists that process, then he will go through the law of compensation. If he willingly engages that process, he'll go through the law of repentance. Yeah. But either way, he's going to go through the process. <laughs> because as, we, as is the theme throughout this message, God's laws govern. The, he can't change that. He can't change that. And, and this, this action on the errors is, is actually loving it's mm. so loving yeah. he's saying no no i want i want love to exist in this universe and so i'm going to work on these errors yes and yeah. and god has put in this framework that's constantly keeping everything in order yes and people believe that through their exercise of their will that anarchy is possible and it's not possible the way god's created a the universe there is no anarchy that's possible except in our imagination <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah okay down to the last paragraph um, 
When a spirit first enters the spirit life, it does not necessarily feel the scourging of these memories. And this is the reason why you will so often hear the spirit who has so recently left his mortal life assure his friends or sorrowing relatives at the public seances that he is very happy and wouldn't again be on, in the earth life and similar assurances. Mm. But after a while, memory commences its work as the soul is awakened and then never ceases until the penalties are paid. I don't mean that the spirit is necessarily continuously in a condition of torment, but substantially that. And relief does not come until these memories cease their awful lashings. Some spirits live here a great number of years before they receive this relief, while others more quickly obtain it. So, so here he's talking about how the conscience of the individual, which is an inbuilt part of the soul, acts upon once a person becomes conscious of it in the spirit world. It becomes, so they're now consciously aware of their own conscience and their own mm. memories, rather than trying to forget their yeah. life. Once they become aware, this conscience now works upon them and causes them to have emotional pain, causes them to have emotional suffering for the actions that they've taken that were out of harmony with love that they recognise now is out of harmony with love. Yeah. Um, until the point that they recognise they're out of harmony with love, they will continue doing them and continue to degrade their condition, even in the spirit world, until that point is reached where they now realise that they are doing or taking actions out of harmony with love and that's when they stop. And once they stop, their memory and their conscience berates them and mm -hmm. continually berates them until such a point that they no longer remember that they did such a thing. So they're working, they're expiating from their soul all that time. Through this, the pain. The pain the is pain. causing the expiation of the actual emotion yeah. that triggered their reason why they took the action that was out of harmony with love. So that's the slow law of compensation way of dealing with the uh, the break, breaking or using our wills to break the laws of God. Of love, yeah. Mm. And I think a lot of people experience this on earth where of they... Of course, but they sudden, don't have any knowledge of that. Of yeah. what's actually happening. Yeah. But, but often uh, you hear about people who suddenly open up and have this feeling of conscience or life gets so difficult that suddenly they feel, wow... I've really hurt people around me and, yeah, yeah. and the and conscience... there's lots of things that are governed on earth or, or geared on earth towards having this recollection. You know, the whole 12-step program for Alcoholics Anonymous is all, is all governed around this program. But unfortunately, it's engaged intellectually for most, not based on their heart. Yeah. But, uh, but it is a process of trying to help people become aware of their choices and their decisions and how they affect other people's lives. Yeah, yeah. And, mm. and I've had many people who just, just through doing the Through the Mist book group, um, there we're not really talking specifically about, we touch on a lot of these themes that we've just talked about, but just through the opening up emotionally towards the material, suddenly they realise, wow, I'm... I've been hurting my sister or mm. I, that thing I did in my childhood. Is so this emotional openness, God's built it so that our conscience becomes more... Become aware. Uh, yeah, yeah, to the fore of our... Most people, though, I find, don't allow themselves to feel the scourging, scourging yes. of their own conscience. You know, yes. they, they um, are constantly trying to avoid the lashings of their own conscience. And there are, you know, there are a number of different ways we can handle the lashings of our own conscience. We can become self-attacking, which is not actually a way of handling the lashings of our own conscience. Uh, we can get really angry and resistive and hurt other people more, which is also not very conducive to our future happiness. Um, but we, we, or we can go through the law of compensation, which is about really acknowledging and also feeling about what we have done in the past. Or we can go through repentance. Mm. Uh, God's given us these choices um, that we have available to us. Most people don't choose the, the law of forgiveness. They choose the law of compensation. Of compensation. And mm. I'm really interested, I think, in the following message from Joseph. He talks about the law of repentance and forgiveness. Yeah. And I'm interested to contrast with you the, 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 two. the, the two laws. Yeah. 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 I, I feel that in these, the reason why we're going through these messages is because 
the majority of people on earth do not understand any of these truths. And in fact, I, I feel quite strongly, the majority of people who are coming along to our seminars and who have been coming along for many years still, still do not understand, understand the importance of these truths in their day-to-day -day life. And, uh, and I feel, you know, this is, these, are, these are essential things to know. Yeah. before you pass yeah essential things for your future life i feel yeah. yeah yeah okay is it up to me i think so yeah the greatest cause which operates is it i might have been here yeah. the greatest cause which operates to relieve these spirits of these memories is love i now mean the natural love and this love embraces many qualities such as remorse and sorrow and the desire to make amends for injuries done etc until the spirit's love is awakened, none of these feelings come to him. He cannot possibly feel remorse or regret or the desire to atone until love, no matter how slight, comes into his heart. He may not realise just what the cause of these feelings may be, but it is love just the same. Mm -hmm. Very good paragraph. This is now, we're talking about the natural love here, not divine love. And but we're talking about the law of compensation at work, aren't we're we? We're talking about the law of compensation yeah. at work, which does require remorse and sorrow, desire to make amends. It does require all of these things. And um, what I like here is his statement that until there is a, just a smidgen of love inside the person that triggers some kind of feeling of remorse or regret or desire to return, it's, a, that it, it's some kind of love that they demonstrated generally that causes that particular awareness to go, oh, wow, I just realised that I must have done something wrong there yeah. and then have a desire to fix it. Yeah. And without, without love, without the natural love that comes from within the person developing, they will not embrace that. So there are many spirits, uh, many people on earth, many spirits who have religious backgrounds who have, had not this realis have not yet had this realisation of love demonstrating their unloving behaviour. So, for example, we often get emails from uh, people condemning us through the Bible or whatever and telling us we're going to go to hell and they're swearing at us and cursing us and whatever else, not realising that in this moment they're demonstrating the truth of this statement and that love hasn't touched their heart yet. Yeah. Because if love had touched their heart, they would never be able to say the things that they're saying, no matter what their underlying reasoning is. Yeah. They'd never be able to say it yeah. because their heart wouldn't motivate them to say such things. Yeah. So, so just the smidgen of love inside of a soul causes them to change with regard to these particular matters. And this is why I'm interested in our later discussion to contrast because I feel um, even some people we know, people around us, have engaged this sort of a process, but this is distinct from what, repentance is yeah a lot of people believe this is repentance yes when we feel some natural love we go wow i feel sorry about that i would like to make amends and um start to feel some pain about what they've done mm. and yet that is different from god's law of repentance in action and so yeah. Yeah. as we get to it i'd like to talk to you about it again. sure sure okay all right well i'll read the closing statements sure. well as these various feelings operate and he acts in accordance with them, a memory here and there will leave him, never to return. And as these memories in turn leave him, his sufferings become less, and after a while, when they have all left him, he becomes free from the law, and it, as to him, becomes extinct. But it must not be understood that this is a work of quick operation, for it may be years, long, weary years of suffering, before he becomes thus free and once more a spirit without sin or these memories. This is the way the great law of compensation is satisfied. It cannot be avoided, but all its demands must be met until sin and error are eradicated and the soul returned to a pure state. But this gradual release from these penalties does not mean that a spirit is progressing in his journey to the higher and brighter spheres. Because even without this torture and torment, he may still remain stationary as to the development of his higher nature, mental and moral. Mm. But when he has been re relieved of these sufferings, he is then in a condition to start towards the progression that I have spoken of. As you are tired, I will continue the balance of my discourse when I write again. With all my love, I am your true friend and professor, Joseph H. Salyuts. So here he's stating that even after you've gone through 
all of the laws of compensation regarding a certain fact, it doesn't mean you're going to progress. Mm -mm. Because to progress, you have to engage moral and mental and eth ethical issues that you may not have yet engaged because of all of these errors that you've had in your soul. Yeah. So you have to actually absorb new truth in order to progress. That's what he's really saying. Mm -hmm. You can't just sort of go through the law of compensation and then expect that you now progress because all you've done is you've worked your way through the first dimension of the spirit world and possibly entered the second. Yeah. <laughs> but you still have yet to really progress because you've yet to engage all the ethical truths of God, all the moral truths of God, and you've yet to engage more mental development. And this is all notwithstanding the divine love path. This is all separate to yeah. the divine love path. This is for any spirit in any chosen yeah. way of progression. And I feel that is the case. This applies to many of the people who have been listening to us as well. That They are still trying. They still have very little moral development, for example. We see, you know, people bed hopping from one partner to another partner all the time. This is an indication that there's a very little moral development. So yeah. while they may be going through the compensatory effects of their past behaviour, they still have yet to develop this moral, this solid moral stance of only wanting to connect to their soulmate, for example. Yeah. And you, you see people doing it with regard to the justification of rage in, in families, you know, where you see the, the everyone fighting all the time and bickering all the time and, and being judgmental and angry towards each other all the time, and they're saying they're progressing. No. They might be emotionally processing past actions and working through the compensatory effect of those past actions. But if they're creating more... they're creating more. ...that they're going to need to engage that same process. With. Exactly. So the soul really can't progress. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not until they get into this state of having some ethical behaviour that they're ever going to progress. And this is notwithstanding the divine love mm. because the laws of divine love which do, which do uh, are very different to the laws of natural love. In the end, if you're engaged in this process where you can't even be ethical, you're never going to engage the laws of divine love under yeah. that, in that condition. Yeah. And, so, and so most people we know have yet to fully engage the laws about divine love and divine truth. Yeah. They're mostly still engaging the law of compensation and even then incompletely so because they are still taking actions that, create further future penalties yeah. upon their soul that they must compensate for. Yeah. So it's very damaging to do this and, and I feel it very important for us to understand this law. I feel the majority of people who listen to us are still engaging the law of compensation in their day-to-day -day life and because of their lack of understanding of that law, they are still creating constant penalties yeah. for their soul. And it's like I've drawn on the board many times where they, in the course of a day, they go up in their development, down in their development, up in their development, down, up, down, up, down, due to the decisions that they make. And as a result, the net result at the it's end of the day is pretty much the same, pretty much the same as when they began the day. Yeah. And, and that is how the majority of people are still living their lives, I feel. To truly progress we need to make some soul level progress that's different to that. Yeah. And that's why the next session that we do on this discussion would be good. Yeah, very mm. good. But even if, if we can just recap the truths that, yes. that Joseph Salyards has given us in this message, because many times throughout it we've gone, if people could get this one truth, if yeah. people could get this one truth, it would change their whole life. So, yeah. so, um, so let's recap. Let's recap. The first truth he tells us is that when you pass... This is not the end of your life. <laughs> you continue on in the life. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a very important truth. It's an important <laughs> truth. That, that is... a lot of people think they believe, but their actions in their day-to-day -day life on this earth demonstrate they don't believe it at all. Yeah. So yeah. if people even lived in faith of that truth, yep. their, their actions would change. And that last law we were talking about would have less action upon them. Exactly. Yeah. And the okay. next one, he says that no man can of his own power make his condition or position in the spirit world just what he would like to have it be. <laughs> in other words, we can't will ourselves to get into a nice location. Yeah, God's, God's got the um, control over that, yeah. not us, yeah. not us personally. Yeah. The next thing he said that um, really moves me was just about that help is necessary for us to grow. It comes and from external. It's external to us, the help that we receive. Yep. And I feel if we could all get okay with that truth, <laughs> lives would change. We wouldn't would be change. so resistive to getting help externally. Like exactly. How many people come up and say, 
I'm really afraid to talk to you. I want to ask you a question, but I'm afraid yeah. of what the answer is. And I said, well, while you're afraid of what the answer is, I can't really give you yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, it's and it's like, a double-edged sword as well, oh, a double-edged truth in that um, help, we're going to have to ask for help. Yep. But when we do, there's masses of it available. Yes. There is so much help available to us. And like, isn't that yeah. beautiful? Yeah. <laughs> so we need to not see ourselves as our own saviour but we need to see ourselves as a person who can exercise their will to absorb new truth from the universe, from externals, Yes. other than ourselves. Yeah. And if we are willing to absorb this new truth, the speed at which we absorb it will determine the speed of our progress. Yes, yeah. yes. Which is what he's basically this saying. This is what he's saying, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Another one is when a spirit once commences to progress, the progress is exponential in nature. Yeah. In, the, in, this, in that once you've made a start, if it's in the right direction, that's the key, the, the key <laughs> yeah. then it will you will continue to progress exponentially. If it's not in the right direction, you'll progress short for a short period and then become stagnant uh, for longer periods of time. Yeah. If, if, if your progress you know, is, 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 is not in based in it, yeah. And that's another feedback mechanism we have to go, uh -huh, I yeah. need to check out the truth in this. Yeah. But that's also a very hopeful message, this exponential growth. That, And I often say to people, look, it feels hard in the beginning because our resistances are the biggest. And as we go on, yeah. you know, we, we begin to be able to then feel God more, receive truth. And, and it... Although my experience too is that particularly on the earth here, you <laughs> go through periods where, um, where your, your resistance to certain emotions causes you to stop. Yes. And, and, you know, you can see that it's not because of any other factor other than your resistance to your own emotion. So it's not because you, don't, you aren't, haven't established the truth. It's because you're not practising it yeah. <laughs> that causes it to stagnate. That's the bit about will that he yeah. wants us to know. Yeah. And I notice that the my desire. willingness to practise the truth, particularly emotionally, depends on the depth of the pain that exists at the time. So when the depth of the pain is very deep, it often, you know, you go through periods where you do stagnate because of the pain being very deep and your unwillingness to feel it. Yeah. If you're willing to feel it, you can continue progressing all the time. But as soon yeah. as you're unwilling to feel it, then of course your progress stagnates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in that place, you don't lose the prior, all knowledge. the prior knowledge doesn't come up for questions. You don't have to retrace your yes. steps. You just have to hang with you the, need to be persistent yeah. in forward steps yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah. okay next truth um is about immortality yes uh, primary truth i feel about that immortality of the soul cannot be guaranteed unless under one condition which we haven't discussed yet. yes um, what he's telling us here is it's not guaranteed it's not guaranteed and there's proof that it's not guaranteed because almost every p person on earth and in the spirit world still has a feeling that they're not immortal yeah until they meet this one criteria. Yeah. And it's not logical. I like how he's applying logic. It's not logical to assume that just because I didn't die at the death of my physical body doesn't mean I might, might not, not die, die at some point in the future. Time yeah. in the future. Exactly. Yeah. It's an illogical statement. Many spiritualists use that statement, but it's totally illogical. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, next thing he talks about is that change is eternal. Yes. And, and this is a very important law to understand too, that if... If you get to a point of stagnation on something, that, that, that's always a worry. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you need to, you need to um, think about and feel about what, why you are stagnant. Yeah. And so if you found that a religious faith has brought you to a point of stagnation, then you obviously need to change something. Yeah. And if you don't change something, then things are not going yeah. to change around you. And so. if, if we're resistive to change, we're, total, we're actually working against one of God's laws exactly. that's eternal. Which, which God wants us to continually grow and change, yeah. continually grow and change. Yeah. So, yep. yeah. Okay, next law that he discusses is the law of compensation, which we've just now recapped. Yes. And the beautiful thing about that, I felt for me, was just that when love touches you or when you find love inside of yourself, your conscience kicks in and this great law that God has designed to help error come out of us immediately yes. starts to work upon us. Yes. And we can't, um, even if we've learnt the divine truths about divine love and the law of forgiveness and repentance and so forth, we can't underestimate the power of this law of compensation in our lives because 
Because when we're not engaging the laws regarding divine love, this is the law that is governing our lives. Yeah. And, and for many of us who think we're on the path to divine love, we're still engaging it through this law. We're not on the divine path yet. Yeah. We're engaged in this law, the law of compensation. And we need to understand that we are and the reasons for it is existence. And its reasons for existence are all loving. Yeah. Because if we didn't go through this process, because we're resistive to going through the other process, if we didn't go through this process, then there'd be anarchy in the universe. And, yeah. and in God's universe, anarchy is not possible. So, so this law is a, a primary governing law to the human soul. And also for myself, I was just saying to you this morning, there's some issues that I don't feel like... I can feel my will is saying, I don't want to Go there. forgive or repent on that issue at yeah. the moment. And I'm thankful for the law of compensation because it's bringing me the pain of that yeah. all the time. It's showing you that it's that's showing state me that that is incorrect. Oh, that yeah. hurts. That I don't, you know, yeah. I don't like saying it even. That oh, I don't feel like I want to forgive, you know. And yeah. there's a, but that law is working on me, and I can, I can see that now that that's a good thing. Yeah, that, and it that, exposes the underlying emotional that's, condition. That's what I mean. Yeah, and that's yeah. beautiful because then. You've identified what you need to repent for. Exactly. <laughs> Without the law of compensation, we would never be able to identify what we need to repent for. And there's certain issues in my life just recently that I've suddenly realised, oh my gosh, the level and brevity of what, has ha what I've done yeah. and um, recognising, wow, I was complete, my conscience was dead to that issue. You know, I was quieting my conscience to this issue yeah. for such a long time and now it's here with me and, okay, I might not be in repentance about it, but yeah. the law of compensation is working me. I feel like yeah. I can almost, I don't know if I can say that, but I can submit to the law of compensation and it's going to bring me to a point of repentance. Exactly. Yeah. yeah I feel that um, it's not a given or a guarantee that the law of compensation would lead you to divine love. But, but without the law of compensation operational, it won't lead you any law <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at all. <laughs> you know, so, so it's a very important law to understand completely. Yeah. And also important to see it constantly governing our lives, um, whether, particularly when we're resistive to being repentant. Yeah. And most of the time we are resistive to being repentant to things we can't see. Because if we could see them, we might be more repentant. Yeah. And the law of compensation helps expose to our, uh, to our awareness, the things that we can't see that we need to become repentant for. That's what I feel. Mm. I feel the more I open up emotionally, the more my conscience jumps into the party and yeah. shows me things and that is yeah. the start. And yeah. maybe we can discuss a bit of that, uh, the contrast between the law of conversation and how it works and the law of forgiveness and repentance and how it works. Uh, when we dis when we discuss uh, yes. the next message of, from Joseph Saliards, which will probably be next week or week after or something like that. <laughs> We've gone on a bit today. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I feel we, we need to see the contrast in it so that people get a bit more of a complete picture in their day-to-day -day lives of what law they're actually engaging. Many of them believe they're engaging the laws of divine love when they're actually engaging the laws of natural love, yeah. which are fine because you want to engage... Either or, yeah. <laughs> or both, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, because otherwise you're not engaging any of them and you're still continuing in behaviour that's causing further compensation in the future. So you definitely yeah. want to engage one yes. of them. Yes. But, but it's far better, of course, to understand the difference between these laws so that you can grasp them and then have some, it has some impact on your future in terms of the speed of which you resolve issues. So I find that at the moment, for example, I'm engaging the law of compensation a lot because of deep painful issues that I'm unwilling to face inside of myself and and you've you just got to be aware of that you know mm. that that no the reason why you're going through this pain is because you don't want to accept certain things and there's a reason why you don't want to accept them and and the key is to have them exposed to you so that you can at least begin to work your way through whether you want to accept them at some point in the future or not yeah and I think for myself in the past my tendency was to become very self-punishing about my conscience and the law of Which compensation. Is actually another thing you get was, to compensate for. Exactly, in the <laughs> I'm just not loving myself now love yourself, about not yeah. loving somebody else or, yeah. or whatever it is. And yeah. um, it was avoidance of just letting this law work on my soul. And but also and avoidance of terror and fear and other emotions. Many isn't emotions. It? You know, yeah. Avoidance of being humble to specific emotions yes. causes us to take actions that are often out of harmony with love. 
in yeah. our day to day life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I said to you recently, if I just the avoidance of fear that if I you feel can like get rid of that. That has created yeah. most of my soul damage. Yes. Yeah, you and know, I feel the avoidance of fear creates most people's soul damage. Actually, well, logically, you, I suppose. If you think about yeah. it. So, yeah. yeah, and, you know, the avoidance of fear, there's law of compensation effects on, on as well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, Two other things, yeah, sorry, yeah. that um, I thought were really just interesting in terms of spirits and relating to spirits. Mm -hmm. The first that he pointed out was that um, spirits often tell us untested belief systems that they have yes they very they, frequently yes and that's dangerous for us on earth yes. to to believe things that the spirits are telling us if they haven't themselves tested them yeah uh, and sometimes they've tested them but are not aware of a greater law yes so they might have tested the particular thing they're talking about but never tested another thing that's even better yeah and so yeah. you know as a result of that they're telling us the thing that they believe to be true without knowing that there's an additional truth which actually makes the other law subservient or subject to the yeah. new law that they could have used. Yeah. And I love that about the Padgett messages because it's all about messages from spirits, but within all the messages there's also clues as to how to relate to spirits exactly. in channeling and exactly. things. And the second thing that he highlights is that when spirits first pass over, the full workings of the law of compensation may not be present and for, for many years, in fact. Yeah. Mm. God is waiting for the love. Well, it requires oh, awareness. Exactly. Yes. The love to create awareness yeah. of what. And until that time, they're still sinning, they're still degrading their soul. And they might be going, I'm having a party. Yeah. But it's really a self-deluded kind of a state. Yeah. And, yeah. A, and they'll get to a point at some point in the future where they realise it wasn't such a party because they've yeah. got all of these law of compensation effects on their soul now that they need to, do, to work yeah. their way through. Yeah. So, yeah, no, those two points are really important yeah. as well. Yeah. There are so many like that, isn't there, in, there the, in are. the messages? Yeah. So we'd like to thank you for joining us in our discussion today with, uh, with Joseph Saliards from, from 100 years ago almost, mm. in 1915, 98 years ago. He wrote this message through James Padgett. And it contains a lot of truths that the majority of people today are still completely unaware mm. of about the spirit world and their future existence. So that's the reason why we shared it with you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks.